Father, we thank you so much for, for tonight. We thank you so much because, uh, Lord, you are our peace. You are, Lord, our Savior. You are the only God, Father. And we thank you so much because you have allowed us to meet with you in this place. So we welcome you. Have your way this night. Please speak to us as we listen. You know more than anyone our hearts, Father. You know more than anyone our, our situations, Lord. So we are here. And we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, for allowing us to know him, for allowing us to, Lord, uh, have a relationship with him. So we give this night to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Once again, we want to welcome you and remind you what we're doing tonight. Like, like I said, uh, we are taking this night to pause, meditate, and reflect on who Jesus is according to Isaiah 9.6. And I'm going to read Isaiah 9.6. You don't have to go through it, but I, I'm just going to read it and, and listen. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that's what we're doing tonight. And we all know what's coming now. We have Christmas coming up, and it can get so busy. Busy with trying to get the gifts, trying to get the food, trying to get the family, trying to travel somewhere else. But we can get so caught up in the busyness of Christmas that we lose, lose the main point which is Jesus Christ. And tonight, we're going we're gonna to reflect. And we're, we have some amazing people that are going to share how Jesus has been Isaiah 9-6 in their lives. So as we listen to them, we're going to also have a time of worship where you can med meditate and think how He is that in your life and how He can be that in your life. For me personally, He has been mighty God. Me and my wife are, are taking a big step of faith. And let me tell you, it's scary. It's, be it's bigger than ourselves. But we have seen that Jesus is going before us. And he's breaking down walls. He's opening rivers. He is showing us his mighty hand. And he's letting us rely on him. So let's give a welcome to the people that are going to be sharing tonight. And let's give all honor and glory to our Lord tonight, okay? Hi, <laughs> my name is Chelsea Pearsall. Um, so the words mighty God are truly a testament to how much God has moved in my life. To explain to you how mighty he is, I wanna start by how he helped me to surrender to him. Six years ago, I had come out to my family, friends and coworkers as a transgender. I was living in many sins. I was breaking eight of the commandments but the worst was the steep deceptive sin of being transgender. I fell so deep into a lie that God hated me. People told me that God didn't exist and there was a mistake with the gender I was born as. I was told that only hormones and surgeries could fix this. I came out to my family, friends, and coworkers. They were all really accepting of me and even supported the process. I took hormones for one year and tried to pass for a man with the way I dressed, the way I spoke, and the name that I went by. In 2015, my mom asked me if I wanted to move to Las Vegas, and I immediately said yes, knowing that the city would offer me all the things that I delighted in. I came here with every intention to get all the surgeries available to transition completely from female to male. When I moved here, I was unable to find a job and couldn't continue the hormone treatments or get the surgeries I so desperately wanted. In August 2016, a lady named Gabby shared how her life was similar to Job. Job. A few months later, I found myself searching on my phone for a church near me. I came across this church, saw where it was located, but scoffed at the idea. A few more months later, I found myself driving here, wondering what I was doing. Like a zombie, I walked into the church and sat down. I was in a trance, and at the end of the service, my hand raised for the altar call. Then I found myself walking forward and mumbling the prayer that Pastor Derek said. I shuffled to the prayer room for follow-up and asked what I was doing. 
I ran out of the room as fast as possible and rejected God saying, no, I wanted nothing to do with what happened. And I, he wouldn't let me. He kept bringing me here. I came four or five times between then and January of this year. I started coming to church more, not knowing why. Shortly after that, God started revealing himself to me in such mighty ways that I can't even explain to you. Sometime right before Easter of this year, I can't remember exactly when, I told God, help me accept Jesus for real. I don't know how to do this. And he gave me the faith and belief that I needed to accept Jesus into my life. That is one of the reasons why he's a mighty God to me. There are so many more reasons for me why he is mighty. Within two months of me surrendering to God, he took all of those sins away that I was committing completely. He also took my desire for same-sex attraction, as well as everything that had to deal with me being transgender. He completely healed me of all that deceit that this surrounds that enormous lie. God helped me find who I was and who he made me to be, which was a female. God completely took away all the anger, hate, rudeness, and he replaced it with his love. I have a very limited time. So I just want to share with you why God is so mighty. It's the reason why I'm sitting here. I'm so shy and and introverted. I wanted nothing to do with people. I wasn't caring, never helped anyone out, never wanting to serve others. And over the past couple of months, God has taken all of that away. I would not be able to be here in front of you without God giving me the confidence to, to, since all of y'all, you intimidate me. (laughs) And um, thank y'all for praying for me. And that is why, you know, God has moved mightily to answer your prayers so that I could be here sharing for you. So for these reasons and so many more, he is a mighty God. God is so extremely mighty, I can't even put it into words. But the Lord gave me this poem, a poem that correlates very closely to my testimony and just how mighty he truly is. I call it beneath the deep. Swimming, sinking, drowning, water everywhere, surrounding me like his love, yet I don't see the light. I don't know which way is up, but the enemy whispers lies, bringing me farther down into the deep. I can no longer look up. My heart beats hardened. My soul cries sinful, scared, overwhelmed, lost, flailing in an unknown world, lost in an unknown time, bound by an unknown fear, stricken, worthless, failure. Deeper and deeper I sink. No air, can't breathe, can't face my sins. I don't want to admit them. I find myself embracing the darkness. How far have I gone? I don't look up. In my mind, I know where to turn, but I refuse to acknowledge. I willingly swim down deeper, going farther without realizing the danger, thinking it is natural to be in the dark, to keep going down. I don't know the light, no words, no speech, no joyful song. I go hungry and thirsty, though I eat of the dark and drink of many sins, trying to satisfy my soul. I have become heartless, hungry, tired, thirsty. I go deeper still while my body screams for life. Things are given to me that come from nothing and go to nothing. Deceit, lies, sins. I'm being overpowered. I'm being misled. Deeper I go, not knowing any more light, not seeking any more good, only enjoying the world as I drown. And as my soul was dying, suddenly a hand came down beneath the deep and scooped me up, but I beat my fist against it and tried to wiggle free. I looked and saw a light, but my heart was beating for darkness, so I fought. I wanted to keep the dark things made of nothingness, for it is what I knew, and I rejected the things of light, afraid of what I didn't know. My eyes looked to the deep, longing for its promises, even as my lungs cried for life, but the hand did not let go. Before I knew it, I was brought out into a world where there was light shining brightly all around, and my feet were put upon a solid rock. My lungs gasped its first breath of life. 
I did not catch my breath before walking to the edge and looked with passion at the darkness. But before I could leap in, the hand held me back and the light shone brighter. I fell to my knees and cried, closed my eyes and felt a warm embrace of love, peace, joy, and love. Then the hand stood me up and took a veil from my eyes. And when I looked at the deep, behold, I saw my sins amongst those things which should not be dwelled. I looked up and saw a savior whom I had never known. And only in vain did I hear his name, which came across my lips in praise. Yet I sat upon the edge and dangled my feet in the water where darkness swirled and demons raged while looking up at a great light and smiling with the light, my hands stretched high, singing of his name, kicking my legs in the shallow waters. I beg not to be this way. He has given me a taste, and now I have seen. And I pray to serve him, for he is the true God who has saved me from beneath the deep. Good evening, everybody. My name is Joe. Um, God has revealed himself to me as everlasting father. Um, being a, a child who was abandoned at a young age, I, I didn't know who I was, and I didn't have an identity, so I, I looked to the streets and to the world um, to find out who I was. That led to a series of bad decisions that led me into uh, federal prison, and in 2005, two years into a sentence, um, and a year in <clears throat> out of solitary confinement. I was uh, released to general population, um, full of anger and hate. And my only goal in life at that time was to become a better criminal, um, to learn a way to become a better drug dealer. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I wish I could tone it down, but I, as Brother Kenny would say, I'm gonna call a spade a spade. I was ironing my um, pants and um, I was actually plotting on how I can go back to solitary confinement. So I was looking for somebody to uh, take my anger off so I could just go back and sit in a cell alone. And God sent a man my way to um, perfectly explain Christ and him crucified. It was the first time that I had heard clearly um, the voice of God saying that he gave his life for my life. <clears throat> and the scripture of John 10, that my sheep hear my voice. And when I heard that, vo that, that word of God, my heart like tore open. And I, the thought for the first time in my life came into me that I could possibly be a child of God. Getting all nervous, I, I quickly excused myself from the conversation and, and pretty much ran to my cell. My heart going this way and my mind going that way, I felt like I was being torn apart. But for the first time in my life, I felt like I was at the right place at the right time. And uh, I had a decision to make. So I cried out to God, my father. I said, Father, God, if, you, if I am your child, please fill me with your spirit. Change my life. And he filled me with the spirit in a jail cell, and he saved me. And... My life has never been the same. He delivered me from the deep anger, and he gave me an identity above all else. Since then, things have been hard. I've been a prodigal son, but nevertheless a son. And I have an identity in Christ. Today, I'm a happily married man to a beautiful woman in Casey. She's God-fearing. I have my children who are growing up in the church. And if you guys haven't met me, I'm I get to greet you guys on Wednesday nights at the door, and I'm grateful for everything that the Lord has not only done in my life, but what he's doing in my family's life. And pastor, a man who's all in and who loves God, and I'm grateful for all of you guys. Thank you. Praise God. And <clears throat> sorry, I wasn't talking for like so long. So, <laughs> um, so 
and they asked me to share my testimony. Um, I was like, I don't really have one. <laughs> and I think that's how a lot of people feel, you know, growing up in church and um, not getting to experience a lot of things uh, like other people up here. You can kind of sort of feel that your story doesn't really matter and that it's not of importance and you're not going to get the same amount of, I don't know, response, respect, or pity that people want. But I think out of hearing all these stories and looking at a lot of people here, I think one of the biggest things that when you share these kind of things and you share your story and you share who you are, um, you're just not expecting that. And when God calls you to do things like this, you're not expecting respect or pity. You're just wanting the name of Jesus to be glorified. And overall, you just want to get the word out there, you know? So my testimony is that Early this year, um, I was in, I was going to UNLV, and I was enrolled as an elementary education major, and I was okay with being a teacher. I was very indifferent to what my career was going to be, and um, was like, I don't really care. I guess I'll go to school. I guess I'll be this. I guess I'll say yes to whatever comes my way. And that's kind of how I was making decisions. So not really making them, kind of just being a yes woman to just whatever was coming my way. And I remember that I was driving home from school one day and I was just like, I just really hate this place. <laughs> and it wasn't like sarcastic, like I was like really hating just being there. and. Like, I would go to class, and I was like, I don't want to hear this man talk about geography. I don't care about tornadoes. <laughs> I, I'm like, I just don't care. And I was like, I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. I don't know, something better to appear, something meaningful, purposeful for my life. And everybody was like, oh, like, you like to serve. And I'm like, yeah, yes. Like, oh, you like to do stuff, you know, for the Lord? I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess, yeah, sure. That's what I do here. And he's like, oh, you're such a sweet, shy girl. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, I, I was just, like, not present a lot of the time. And I think when you're like that, it's like you're very prideful. You Sometimes people think like pride is something that is like, oh, like you feel like you're better than everybody else. But it's just like when you think about yourself more than anybody else, and that can just mean like, oh, I'm not good enough. You're being prideful. Oh, like I'm never going to amount to anything. You're being prideful because you're putting yourself before anybody else. And I think I was like very prideful. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I'm not good enough. Or oh, like, I'm not gonna do anything. And it was always like that. And I was okay. And that's another thing, conformity. I was okay with being not good at anything. <laughs> and that's not good because you were all of us as children of God, we were called for so much more. And that place of conformity and being at the bottom is very, very egotistic and prideful. Um, wanting to be alone is also very prideful. <laughs> wanting nobody to get close to you is also very prideful. And I think all of that fed into me being indifferent. So one day coming home from morning prayer, I was like talking to my mom and she was like, oh yeah, we were just having fun and blah, 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 we were talking. And then I was like, 
I was just like, Mom, like, I'm not going to go to school anymore. And she's like, why? I'm like, I'm just done with it. Like, God has, has something bigger for my life. And, and I just feel it. Like, I feel like I want to throw up. And <laughs> so that's how I know it's, like, big. And I was like, I, <laughs> I just feel like crying. And I'm like, but I'm not depressed. And I was like, but I just feel like it's so much bigger than me. And she's like, okay, yeah. Like, I, like, you know, if the Lord is calling you to ministry, like, you know, this is your time. And I was like, okay. And so we drive in our driveway, and my dad was downstairs, and my mom was like, hey, Ruby wants to tell you something. And I was like, oh. <laughs> what? And she was like, yeah, she wants to tell you how she's going to serve the Lord now and how she's going to quit school. And my dad was like, he was not having it. <laughs> he was like, oh, that's not, that's not what we planned. That's not what we planned for you. And I was like, hey. And my dad was just kind of like, what, like what, is, what are some steps you're going to take? Or what is your idea? What are your goals? What, what's the end goal here? Like, I don't have a problem if you want to serve on Wednesdays or Saturdays or Sundays, but like, you can't just focus yourself to being at church. And I was like, well, it's not being at church. Like, I want to do much more than that. But like, I, I, I didn't like let everything sink in. And I didn't, didn't let anything settle in. So I was just like, not, did not know anything, did not know what to tell him. So he did most of the talking, um, and it was more of an aggressive tone talking. It was more like he was not having it with me talking, and it was more like I'm not going to talk to you for like a week and a half kind of talking. And um, he left. He left um, to work, and I was just like, all right, I can handle and then my brother comes in, like he was hearing the whole conversation, and he was just like, he came in, he's older than me. And he was like, you are so dumb. <laughs> and I was like, I know. <laughs> and he was like, you are so dumb. You're going to throw your whole life away. You don't even know what you're going to do. And I was like, I know. It's just like, dude, I, I don't know why my mom did this. Like, I'm in the same boat as you guys. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's see what's going to happen. And, you know, as things started to progress in the following week or so, I started praying and praying and praying and just seeking the Lord as to what I was supposed to do in next steps. And, you know, you just want everything. And I was like, I need an explanation as to why I'm dropping out of school and <laughs> why I'm not getting some money back from my university. and. I need to come up with these answers for, for my parents and for my family and for myself. And I just felt such at peace. And I was just like, you, you know what you want me to do. <laughs> like, I, I, can't, I can't come up with anything. Like, I'm like, OK, so what do I do now? Like, how do I get to where I want to be or what I think it's in my mind? And then. Um, I had a talk with um, David, and that was when I was like, okay. So there, some things started to settle in, and I had in my mind, like, emotional 21-year-old me was like, you know, I'm just going to go live somewhere else, and I'm going to go to Mexico. And I was like, and I'm going to... I have zero money. And I was like, I'm going to go to Mexico and go to a biblical college over there and live over there. And I have no money at all. And I don't even know what I was thinking. And then David, like, I think it was the Lord. He was just like, um, you're going to leave through the big door. You need to go with your parents' approval and the church's approval and the pastor's approval and support and love and do everything right because that's what the Lord wants you to do. And I was like, yeah, that makes so much more sense. And then 
he was talking for some time and then I was like, and I just laid it all on, like just spilled everything. I was like, so I'm kind of in this position where I don't know what I need to do. And then he was like, well, let's see. And I started interning here, meeting new people and the Lord started opening a lot of doors, which I didn't know where was going to happen. And I can say honestly right now, uh, in this time today, I cannot imagine any better plan for my life than what God has me doing right now. Like, in my puny little mind, <laughs> I cannot imagine any other thing I could be doing than even just being an intern and going to school um, and just seeing what the Lord has for me. I see that every day that I'm faithful to the Lord, he is just even more faithful to me. And he has promised me so many things that are just above and beyond what I can ever fathom. And every time I finish something that he has put on my heart to do, is like he completes, he completes it. He, he brings a promise. He tells me, yes, go on, go. And I'm just like, okay. And so like yesterday I had finals and I submitted my final and I was like, wow, like there, I'm done. And then the Lord brings up another promise. He's all like, here you go. And I'm just like, that's so much better than, anything that has ever happened in my life. And that's really like the apex of my life. I can't say I was doing any other thing than just being self-absorbed um, till I saw God's plan and purpose in my life. And that's why God has been my counselor this year. He has really guided my steps in my walk and even pulled me closer to him in ways that I don't think were ever in my repertoire to begin with. And he grows you. And sometimes you think, well, the person that is sitting here is just a person of bad decisions or decisions and mistakes that have brought her or him to this place, anybody that is here. And honestly, it's not even that. It's just the grace of God. Because if he has you here, he still wants to do more in your life. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things. When you're accepting God's will for your life is like all those things that happened or all those decisions that you made don't amount to anything when you have God's will that you're completing now. And it's just like, you're here now, do it now. And that's, that's it. Good evening, everybody doing good? My name is Jessica, um, JP to some of you out here, <laughs> and one of the titles that I'm most proud of is mom, and to um, when she was a teenager, <laughs> mom, <laughs> said a with a lot of sass. Um, when I found out that I was expecting my second daughter 13 years after I had my first daughter, a little bit of an age gap, um, we were given some news that you just, there's nothing in life that can prepare you for some of the things that God's going to handle you. And the only thing that I could liken it to is um, being born and raised in Las Vegas. We have a flurry or two, some wind but I've never really weathered um, a tornado, any kind of severe weather, uh, a hurricane. And 
But I've heard stories that when you're in it, it's like batting down the hatches and it's just, just chaos. Um, so in April of 2009, towards the end of my second pregnancy with my second daughter, we were told that she had a chromosomal disorder that did not support life. And that basically she was going to pass away in utero or sometime very shortly after. And you can't imagine the things that do or don't go through your mind, um, not the least of which is, I don't know how to do this. And God somehow just put us in this little bubble and he had the right people at the right time around us every single step of the way. He was our wonderful counselor. Psalms 139, 16 says that all our days are ordained for him before one of them comes to be. And that he knew my daughter before I had even thought of her. And he knew when her end was gonna be and he knew every bit in between. And he knows every one of ours. And he knew what we were gonna get with her. So we're in this storm and I'm, they're like, okay, well we can schedule this, so on and so forth. They thought it was the best thing considering the situation okay, we can do this. And when you go in and you think, I'm going to the hospital to have a baby and I'm going to pack such and such because you're, you're thinking normal things. And I stood there in my room thinking, I, I can't even fathom what to pack because I don't know if this is going to be overnight. I don't know if this is going to be three days, I ha I, I, I'm like, I just stood there completely and totally numb and had a moment where, and I was like, God, this is, this is not fair. This is not fair. And the only thing I could think, and, and I said this to the Lord, and I love his response. He knows I'm sarcastic, so he's kind of sarcastic in nature back, and I love it. Um, and I said, God, why my child? Why my child? This is, happens to other people. And he calmly says to me, I gave up my son. And I thought, good point. Okay, let's do this thing. <laughs> and uh, so I just threw a few things in a suitcase thinking maybe this will work. I have no clue. We're going to just do this. And um, kind of like I came here tonight. <laughs> well, we're just going to do this. Um, and... We get to the hospital, they're, they're prepared for us, they know what's coming, and it just hits me like a torrent. I'm falling apart, I'm crying, I just, I, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to take a step forward. And uh, once I calm down and they, they get us settled, and, um, and I just kind of release the whole thing to the Lord. And all you moms out there know that when you're in full on labor, you are thinking of nothing else <laughs> whatsoever then labor and taking your next breath and for the love of God, thank you for epidurals. Um, and so I'm going through this process and yes, of course there's this moment where I'm thinking, um, uh, this thing could be happening and, uh, and I, I just hung on and I just breathed and we had music going in the background. It was a Mercy Me song um, about going home. And uh, we all know a lot of their music is about death and dying and going home uh, previously. And I just, I, and that's why I just kept thinking. I just kept thinking, she's going home, she's going home, she's going home, she's going home. And that's what I just clung to. And they had so fully prepared us to have this child be born that never took a breath, that I wasn't the least bit prepared for the fact that she did, and instantaneously so. She's a fighter, she had spirit. And, um, and there she was, all three pounds, nine ounces, and 17 inches of her. 
brown hair, blue eyes, lips like her dad, mom's long fingers. And then we're like, okay, so now what do we do with this? You know, and in any normal situation, you know exactly what you do. And of course, we're, I, I, you're relishing in the fact that she's here, but then there's also this overwhelming sense of any second is the last, and I don't know what to do. And it was a completely and totally different circumstance that God just, just held us. He just cradled us and carried us right on through and gave us 42 hours of the most blessed experiences we got to have her with. And then what we were expecting came. And she took her last breath. And I had told my mom, who was in there with us, um, we had lots of family, said, if for whatever reason, because I had um, was not even able to hold her, I had to have her next to me because I couldn't be away from her for a second. And uh, but I was so fatigued, I just had to have her right here next to me. Said so if if you hear, if you know that she's passed, I don't want to hear that she's died. She's gone home because my baby is going home. And she did, and my mom heard her take her last breath and felt her heart stop, as well as my 13-year-old daughter. And she looked at me as I was staring at my little girl, and she said, Jessie, she's gone home. And I said, I know. And there's that moment um, when a child falls and it just knocks the right wind right out of them, you know? And they, you look at them and you're like, and they're like, and you know the whale is coming, but it just kind of hasn't worked up yet. And that's, that's what I felt, this inside, this, this very calm scream welling up inside me because I thought I don't know how I'm going to take my next breath get out of this bed, hand over my daughter, and I don't know how I'm going to live the rest of my life. Because this is not a thing that people d talk about a lot. You know, it's okay to talk about a lot of things, but um, it's kind of a taboo subject. I never really realized till I went through it. But I'm having this moment, and I'm just laying there and numb, I think, maybe. And I clearly heard the Lord tell me, it's just like David said, he can no longer come to me, but someday I'll go to him. And he got up and he threw a party. And I knew right then and there, that's, that's what it is, that's right. I have to get up, I have to go on because it's okay. And she's home. And then it reminded me that there were people all throughout history that have gone through this long before I had. And maybe seconds later, the pastor from the church that we had been attending walked in and he looked over at us and he says, I, I'm so sorry, I was trying to get here. We had this, this thing happen at church today. And he said, but you know, Jess, I'm just reminded um, right now that David said, He can no longer come to me, but someday, but someday, I'll go to him. And then he asked if it was okay to pray. And of course, we want to pray. And now here's the part at which I am an absolute skeptic and uh, have some trust issues, and they write books about this stuff, and I can assure you I have written no book. Um, and if people told me they'd had some experience, I would have been like, well, that's just so nice for you. And maybe if it happened to me, then I would actually believe you. And God knows my cynicism and sassiness. And they began to pray, and I don't know what he said. I don't know what occurred. They could have been praying for minutes, seconds, hours. I have no idea, because though I know that my body 
was in that bed with my daughter's body. Our spirits were in heaven. And as clear as I can see each and every one of you, I could see heaven. I could feel it. Good Lord, I could feel it. And there was Jesus holding my little girl, just like so, with his hand over her like this, and she's blinking her eyes, just like she would have when she was born into this world, looking around, waking up in heaven, being born into heaven. And here is her heavenly father, her eternal father, with the biggest smile on her face. He's just beaming at her, like, this is my girl. This, look at look at her, isn't she so cute? This is my girl. And she's just looking around, and, and I could feel heaven rejoicing over her, and I could, I could feel God's glory. I could feel that love and that peace and that joy and all of the fruit of the spirit that it talked about that I'd read about so many times that I just, I couldn't comprehend. And I absolutely know that it was the Holy Spirit just moving through me. And, and there's no possible words to explain it. There's not adequate words to describe it. I don't know when it stopped, but I know what I saw. I know what I felt. And if they probably weren't going to send me to the loony bin, I wanted to fly out of that bed and just run around and touch everybody. Oh my gosh, can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? It's the most amazing thing ever. And if we all felt it, if we sought the Holy Spirit more and asked this, this is it, this is it, no one would ever doubt God because all of a sudden my faith was I'm reading stuff and fly, stuff is flying off the pages and the light goes on and I'm like, I get it, I get this, I get it, I get it. And I still had to get up from that bed and I still had to carry on and I was the most joyful grieving mom ever <laughs> because the grief did come, it did. And, and to this day I still think, oh, I wonder how she would look and I wonder how she would be and, and, and that never goes away. Um, but I know what it is now that when we share the love of God and that when we experience this, and this is why sharing is so important, that that is our treasures in heaven. My treasures are in heaven. My Jesus is in heaven. My girl is in heaven. So many more of my family that's gone on is in heaven. And that is why we celebrate right now this this little baby born to another mom and I think of Mary that she was she holding her son thinking that he was born to die probably not but he went to the cross because God knew his beginning and his end but he went there to stretch out his arms for my little girl and that so that I can join her someday and so that we can all join her and that's what our treasures in heaven is, that, and that's why we celebrate. And that's why when the hard things happen, I still go, but there is glory in that. There is glory in it. So I wish you all Merry Christmas. I'm Dan. I just wanted to say that uh, God is uh, definitely my Prince of Peace, for sure. I was, uh, life was very chaotic not very long ago. So I'm going to start off from a youth. I grew up like very heavy metal. Definitely, definitely love it. So uh, I always like, you know, laughed at God, religion, all that stuff. Um, couldn't ignore the signs anymore, though. I was, uh, take it back to a few years ago, I was uh, training this guy in a train yard. I work in a train yard. I was training this guy. Always coming to work real peppy, like, hey, God is good, guys. How are you guys doing? We're just like, hey, what? All right, let's get to work. Like, I, and I was training him one-on-one, -on -one, so, like, he would always talk to me, you know, a little more. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it was like three months of that, and... Uh, I never really talked to him. Yeah, like we lost the contract and we kind of went our separate ways. And he, he would keep in touch every six months or so. He'd call me up or something like that. And um, fast forward, here we go. And I, would, I was getting out of a 13 year relationship. Him hit me pretty hard. I was in, you know, a pretty dark place. And uh, this dude calls me up. He's like, hey, hey, Daniel. It's like, I'm Dan, dude, whatever. <laughs> but whatever. He's like, hey, how you doing, bud? And he's like, I'm like, I'm not doing so good. And I just started like, let it out, you know. Ah, I'm not doing so good, Scott. And he's like, 
hey, I'm gonna be in, in Vegas. How close are you to Vegas? I'm like, I live in Vegas. He's like, oh, I thought you were in Utah. It's like, nah, man, you need to call more often. But I could have called him too, you know, it goes two ways. So anyways, he meets me up for lunch and then like, it was like a two hour lunch. It's just all praying, all lunch. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and right there, I was just like, I was like, I, yeah, I gotta go with God. Like, that's the way to be. And uh, ever since that day, you know, oh, and he's actually the one who, who uh, brought me here to this church. He, I guess he went to Bible college with, I don't know who, but they come here. And uh, <laughs> so that's why I came here. Now I'm here. I'm here three days a week. I don't know. I've, I've seen a lot of you guys. I don't know. Never really introduced myself, though, really. But uh, yeah, I used to, and like I quit. Uh, I used to do, I used to drink, you know, used to pack bowls left and right. That's how I went to sleep. Talk in and, you know, a little rip. Not no more. Quit cold turkey. It's been like, like 40 days now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for me. I mean, God is good, right? Yeah. I'm just going to keep it short here. Well, I'm sharing my testimony, too. I'm not, uh, I don't, uh, I'm so nervous, <laughs> which is so weird because I sing like every week, but it's different than talking. Um, well, my name is Miriam, for those of you who have not met me, and I am extremely introverted. Although I'm up here and I sing worship, I'm like very few friends. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm just going to get into my story, I guess. So because I'm extremely introverted, um, growing up, I was just really close to my family and my people at my church. So my dad was a pastor and I, the church was my second home and I was homeschooled. So another reason why I'm introverted, weirdo. But um, so growing up, I just like stayed really close knit. And one of the reasons is I traveled a lot with my mom and just, you know, when you're at church and you're a pastor's kid, like, you just tend to kind of keep to yourself. And you're just like, I'm just going to keep my bubble because people come in and out. And, you know, that's the way life is. And you just tend to trust uh, only those that are really close to you. So that, for me, personally created a lot of, uh, built up a lot of walls. And I started to just find my identity and those around me. I never really, although I went to church, Jesus to me was Sunday morning. He was the, the songs that we would sing and the cross was amazing. And I, you know, believed in it, but I never lived it. And I never actually had faith in the power that it had because I had never actually seen it. I guess I've never like, aside from the Bible, which I'd never really do dove into until earlier, a couple of years ago. Um, Why well, not get into that, but, um, because of that, I just kind of started um, following whatever, you know, my older sister was doing or my friends were doing, and those are not good things. So um, that kind of dove into, I guess I was like 12 years old. So from 12 years old to 16, I started to party and smoke weed and drink and all these things, but I never missed a Sunday. That was my story. It was like, I did these things, but you know, like I went to church and to me that was Christianity that's the picture that I had and not because anybody else portrayed it that way it's just that's the way that I lived it so although like the sins I guess you could say like the physical sins are yeah smoking and drinking and then leads to sexual immorality and you know all kinds of that but it's not like what I've learned is it's not so much what you're doing it's the effect it has on you and those effects stayed with me even though if I quit or I moved on or whatever. Um, when you do things that are incorrect, which nobody has to tell you it's wrong, you just know it's wrong, um, you have to start lying and you start putting on this mask for other people and you eventually lose who you are because you're not those things. And I feel like for me growing up, it was like, oh, who's Miriam? Oh, well, you know, she's, uh, she is what she does, and it wasn't who I actually am. It was just what I did and the people I hung around with, and it stayed like that for quite some time. So because of that, like, my relationship with Christ ebbed and flowed a lot, and it was, like, super high peaks, and I would go to 
youth camp and come back and be like, whoa, like I love Jesus. And then I'd go on a mission trip and like, oh my gosh, yes, like you can see Jesus' work like all around the world. But then like, you know, because I never had a relationship with Christ, it just completely would die down like a month after. And I'm like, well, I, like this sucks. I only feel close to Jesus when I'm on a mountaintop. And then it wasn't until I was like 16 years old and I got home one day and this was 2015, no, not 2015, it's not, my years are super off, 2013. Um, and I actually had got home and I was, confession, like getting off a high and my mom was like in the kitchen, she was watching a live stream. She's like, uh, sweetie, and I was like trying to like go to my room like so she wouldn't see me. She's like, um, they're live streaming Pastor Chuck Smith's funeral. Like, do you want to see it? I was like, uh, sure, like whatever. She's like, it's like, like a Brian Brothers and Sons, like super talented, whatever. I was like, okay. So I like grabbed it and I just like took the laptop to my room and I like, threw it on my bed. I was just like putting clothes away. And then I love Pastor Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie and all of them. I grew up Calvary, so I knew all of them. And to me, they were just like huge names that like have, I'm in no way connected to them because they're like super Christian and I'm not. And so I'm just listening to it. And then all of a sudden, um, I think at this point in my life, I had already like gone through so many friendships and so many people that like my trust was just completely like done. And it was just like me, my family, and like occasionally I'd pray to Jesus and it'd be great, but that wasn't like, I did not think that Jesus had what I needed because I would see, you know, what I thought that Christianity was. I'm like, I don't really want that. Like, I just want to live and know that you're there and like, I love you, but I'll only love you the way that I want to. And that's going to church on Sundays and occasionally reading my Bible. So back to the story. Um, the laptop was on my bed and I'm just like walking around and then all of a sudden this dude starts playing the guitar and he starts singing a song and it says, I hear your voice and I catch my breath. Well done my child and turn and rest. I was like, that's a really nice song. Those are some good lyrics. It's Phil Wickham. No idea who Phil Wickham was. Um, if you guys don't know who he is, you should look him up. He has great music. But he starts singing this song called Heaven's Song. And I mean, he sang the song, like, convicted. And when he starts, like, illustrating what heaven is, I, like, just sat down. And I'm like, I want that. Like, that song is what I've been looking for and craving for this whole time. Like, I'm so dumb. Like, why did I not know? And so I, like, start crying. And then Greg Laurie goes up. And he, I don't know if it was before or after, but then he does the altar call. And I was literally like, oh my gosh, like I've been a Christian my whole life. Like I didn't, like, am I doing this right now? Like, I didn't know I needed to do this. Like, even though I've grown up in church and I did. And that's when like I recommitted my life to Christ and it felt great. And I'd say it stayed like that for like however many months. Right after that, I went to the Calvary Chapel Worship Leaders Conference because Phil Wickham was playing. That's the only reason I went, no other reason. I was like, I just want to hear this guy live. Um, and I learned a lot in that. And then that was like, yeah, it was great. But literally right after that, I think there was a pivotal moment of like, all right, Miriam, and there's been a couple of these in my life, I've like realized that now. It's like, you can either keep following me and trusting me and, you know, just trust me because I don't know what it is over there. Or there's this other option here where you can see what it leads to, you see what it is, like you decide. And I was 16 years old, super young, naive, and I met a dude, and I was like, yeah, I don't really want a relationship with Jesus, I want a relationship with this guy. And I just listened to my heart, and I shouldn't have. And that year and a half after that, um, to me, my notes are so ghetto, I'm sorry. Um, that, like, although I was had a stronger relationship with Christ than I had before, um, because I had not removed the influences in my life, there was still, like, sin came back in. And at that point, it was no longer just nonchalant. Like, oh, yeah, whatever, I just do this, like, innocently, like, I don't know. I was, it was evident that it was a battlefield at that point because I had surrendered my life to Christ. And then now the enemy no longer had a hold and Jesus was fighting. Like, it was, like, the enemy fighting back. And so it was even worse. And in that year, um, I feel like it was more of a battlefield because I read my Bible more and 
all of that. And I was more involved in church that I was going to at that time. And because my dad was no longer pastoring. So that like really, I would say, uh, what can I say? It made it more evident that there were things of my past that I still had not let go of. And it wasn't like the addictions. It was just what had been left inside of me, which was the lying and the deceiving and just putting on a mask when I would go to church. And so because of, thankfully, my mom's prayers, thank you all your moms who pray out there. We know that God hears your prayers way louder than he does ours for some reason. Um, And God's truly unrelenting love in like whenever I would pray and ask for something and just be like, all right, God, like here I am you know, use me, like, whatever, take away what I, needs to be taken away, he would do it almost instantly. And I feel like, to me, that was, like, God actually listens to me. Like, I'm not, you know, just some other Christian that just, like, okay, whatever, like, before, like, no, he cares, and he has plans for me, and he shows me because he helps me with these things. And I feel like this area right here is where a lot of us get stuck in, and I personally felt like I was stuck in that forever, even though it was only a year and a half. It feels like the longest time of my life because it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the, like, the reason why we stay stuck there is truly because of fear. And I've realized that in my own life is like the fear of, well, if I step out of me having some control, no one's going to love me. If I step out of this, no one's going to forgive me for what I've done because then I have to confess all these things and I don't want to do that. If I step out of this, like, I'm going to be alone. I'm not going to have any friends. And the friends I'm going to have are going to be losers that just, like, want to read the Bible. And, like, not that you guys <laughs> And, like, that's literally what I thought. I'm like, no, like, I want, like, fun friends. I want people to, like, listen to, like, secular music, whatever. And um, so then I finally was like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to surrender completely and I did, and that was not like a, oh, this moment. It was just a daily thing, and that's something that I've come to realize. It's not surrendering once in your life and being like, yeah, like, this is it, but you have to continually, every day, take up your cross, and that's the only way that you can remain sane. <laughs> so I'm just gonna quickly read, since it's almost 8.30. Um, Hebrews 12.1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And that was truly what happened at that point. And so I just pray that tonight, um, if there are any of those weights on you guys, let them go. And don't be afraid of what God has for you, because like the verse says, he is wonderful, and the plans he has for you are amazing. And just because you can't see them, it doesn't mean that they're terrible things. Um, he loves you and he cares for you. And whatever thing you have seen or tasted of him is just the beginning of everything else that he has ready for you. So whatever one of those names are that can relate to you in your life now, trust in that and trust that he is going to be that for you. For many of, of us, uh, there was a moment that was so important. It was the moment when we were at the right time at the right place that we responded to the message of the gospel and that that was the story of many and of all of us tonight there was the right time the right moment where Jesus came and he said will you accept me and tonight we want to give you that invitation because maybe for you this night it will be that night of the right place at the right time at the right moment And let me tell you something, Jesus came, he came, he left, but his message is still powerful, his promise is still still true, that if you respond to the gospel, he will give you eternal life, and he will give you the Holy Spirit, and you will have a relationship with him, and you will truly will say, he's real, because he has changed me. And if this is you tonight, I just want to ask you, if this is you, right place, at the right time, at the right moment, raise your hand, making that decision. Tonight is my night where I receive and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in Him there is life, there is eternal life, and there is forgiveness of sin. If that's you, raise your hand. We want to pray for you. God bless you. Waste this opportunity. If God's talking on your heart, respond to Him. 
Second invitation is maybe for us that many of us, we were children of God. We, we, all, we were, but we were just walking away. And we lost focus of what was important. And maybe that's you right now. You're so busy with everything that you're missing the most important thing, Jesus Christ. And tonight, that it can be the night that you're re reconsidering, surrendering to Him day by day, coming back to your first love, tasting and see that He's good. And if that's you, we also want to ask you to raise your hand and we're going to pray for you that, that God will do a work tonight in your life and nothing will be the same. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Raise your hand and we'll pray for you. We're going to pray and we're going to ask the Lord because He's faithful. He's true. He's real. Anyone else before we, we finish this night? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much because you sent your son. And the message of the gospel, the message of life in Jesus Christ is so real. We thank you so much because he's faithful. He has shown us that we are loved by him, that we can find salvation in him. And I just ask for the people that raise their hand tonight for the first time, Lord, that you will show them, Father, that what they are responding, Lord, is the best and most important decision of their life, Father. That they're acknowledging Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And then they're asking for forgiveness, Lord, and for a new life. Not only that, but they want to see the real Jesus Christ transform their lives, Father. Father, I also pray for the ones that are recommitting their lives to, 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 to Jesus. Father, I just pray that you will grant them the ability for daily surrender, for daily reminder, Lord, what's important in life. Thank you so much because even though Jesus left, he sent the comforter, he sent the helper, he sent the Holy Spirit who will reveal all things, who will guide us to the truth, who will assure us that we are your children. And I just pray, Lord, that we will leave this place spirit-filled, Lord, understanding that our greatest desire is to be with Jesus one day. And that's what we long for. Let us not forget what this season is all about. Help us to be a light in this city and to share that love that was given to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much. Name is on Jesus. Amen.